All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm waiting. Oh, there's a few more people coming in right now. Um, I was about to start having my talk about breaking down the silos. Um, first, a small introduction. My name is Michel van Veldi. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of OneShoe. We're an advertising agency, advertising and digital agency uh, from the Netherlands, and we've been a long-term Drupal member of the community, uh, especially from, uh, for about nine years we've been involved with the, the Drupal project and been contributing uh, in several ways. Uh, and one of our ways is that we share our knowledge on how we grow our company, how we work, and we want to give you all the insights that we have so you can grow as well. Um, uh, we started the agency uh, nine years ago. We're with 40 people now uh, based in the Netherlands and work for international clients. Uh, just a few clients that we work for, for ranging from Nike to Iglo um, and uh, Media Pharma, large pharmaceutical. Um, what I'm going to talk about is not specifically tech or code, but more like a bit of history and a bit of what the future will bring us, and especially for Drupal. Um, so let's start with a bit of history. Um, it was 1980 that this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, created the Internet Protocol. You know, and actually, we should all give him an applause because we thank our jobs to this guy currently. Uh, what a lot of people don't know is that he did it with this guy, Robert Gallio. Uh, they both teamed up working at CERN, and they created actually what we now know as the Internet. And they started a revolution because we are now connected 24-7. Um, in 1985, unwillingly, Coca-Cola started another revolution. Um, what happened at the time, Coca-Cola was uh, basically selling less and less Coke, you know, and they didn't find a, a true reason for it, so they decided to uh, change the flavor of Coca-Cola into what they called New Coke. And they, you know, secretly worked on a new recipe for months, and then they introduced it. And that backfired on them, you know. And in 1985, it turned into the consumer revolution. Because what the consumer did was they all went to the streets, and uh, there's, there's videos online where you see people actually being uh, uh, standing outside in New York pouring new Coke uh, onto the streets and saying, nah, no, 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 we want our old flavor back. And then suddenly the directors, well, the, the board of directors of Coca-Cola thought, well, okay, we don't own Coke. You know, we don't own the flavor. It's the consumer that actually owns the flavor. And they, got, they were receiving about 10,000 calls every day of people asking, like, okay, we want our old Coke back. So after about three, men, uh, three months, they decided to bring in, you know, classic Coke. They introduced it back again as classic. And it's the same uh, brand we all know right now. It's still classic Coke. And the new Coke just went off the market. Um, <coughs> I'm going to take a, a big jump because this is 2008. This guy, you all know him, started the mobile revolution. You know, mobile was there, you know, uh, in, in 2000, WAP was introduced, the WAP protocol, um, but, you know, the, the phones were not there yet, you know, it was it's not user friendly at all, and then suddenly in 2008, Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone, you know, and as a consumer, we suddenly got the possibility to share our dreams, our ideas, but also our remarks on brands everywhere, anytime. So you walk into a shop, you know, uh, the, the, the sales guy is being rude to you. You go on Twitter and you say, hey, I didn't like the guy who was rude to me. And you publicize it all over the Internet. So in terms of the consumer revolution, the consumer revolution was being enhanced by the introduction of the mobile phone. And not specifically the mobile phone as a general, no, the iPhone because the iPhone was suddenly really user, user friendly, you know. And it was possible for you with this iPhone to, to, to share your voice. And it became a really personal device because I was working at the time, um, uh, in, back in, in 2000 already, working for Vodafone, and we installed 
mirrors actually in the shops so people could basically you know, match their face with the type of telephone they were using. So this telephone is a really true personal device. And this true personal device is a part of our life. You know, I think everybody here in here has a smartphone, and the smartphone penetration is going up like that. Um, so I'm already talking about the Internet now. I'm talking about the mobile phone as a, uh, as, as, uh, as a way of communication. Um, and advertisers have been dominating this whole era, you know, um, by making it possible to, 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 to make money, if you know what I mean. Okay, so I'm going to share you some, some advertising statistics. And you're probably all going to wonder, uh, where is this guy going to with this talk? I'll let you know in a second. Okay, so a few advertising statistics. Um, market share of online marketing rises last year from 34 to 38%, this at the cost of print. You know, major publishers around the world are having problems right now, print publishers, because we're all moving over to the internet. Now, print advertising, yes, dropped from 30 to 26%. Television and radio, funny enough, they kept their market share at 26 and 6% of all advertising spending. So, so there's a lot of budget still going into uh, uh, TV and, um, and radio. And they're effective, I can tell you. Um, TV grew her online marketing income, you know, by 70%. That's pre-roll bannering, pre-roll advertising in front of, like, uh, uh, small videos they're sharing uh, via the Internet. Um, why? Why is it growing so fast? Well, that's easy. Because old millennials are now watching TV shows on their laptop, tablet, or smartphone. Um, search, Google search has a 42% market share in online marketing, and that's huge, you know. Um, and display, like in the banner advertisement, you know, that rises from 27 to 42%. And although everybody says, you know, it's not effective, I can tell you, yes, it is effective, but in large numbers, especially when you use retargeting. Okay, now some more statistics. Um, we're talking about a lot of channels here. 22% um, of all companies integrate social channels in their offline advertising. So you have a poster, um, and I'll show you in a second that most of the people, you know, who do outdoor advertisement or uh, uh, toilet advertising, you know, and they don't use socials in there. 29% uh, of all companies think that their online marketing is integrated with their offline marketing. That's not a lot. You know, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, and 90% of all advertisers has no call to action um, uh, in, in their offline marketing. And 85% of all Drupal agencies, well, that's an interesting one, you know, there's the crossover coming. 85% of, of all Drupal agencies focus only on Drupal, whilst the consumer and clients demand an integrated approach. So, and I'm talking about silos. You know, um, when you grow up, you know, um, you are learned to think in silos. You know, uh, you place people in a certain silo. Um, but when we started the agency back in 2006, um, we were being told, okay, guys, you should start an internet company. You know, because the internet is booming, you know, there's a lot of business that says, no, I want an integrated company, I want to combine advertising and internet. So advertising and digital. It says, no, 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 you can't combine that, you know, because people don't understand it. So, well, they should, because when you look at the customer journey, you know, the customer journey, you, know, you walk over the street, you, you see this outdoor advertisement of this Nike shoe, you get interested, you make a crossover, you, you, you get some, some uh, interesting um, uh, details on your mobile telephone. At home, you start surfing, so maybe, you know, do some comparison, and then you actually buy it online. That's multiple channels. You know, but it all starts with you know, your offline uh, campaign. So when we think in silos, you know, we have a major problem because the consumer doesn't think in silos anymore. And I make a statement here that silos are made for farmers, not for marketeers, because the consumer is going through all channels. You know, and why should we, you know, as an agency, you know, just focus on one channel. And I, I, I'll show you some details after this slide. 
You know, this is something to, to, to think about. You know, if the consumer goes through all channels, through all silos, you know, why just focus on one? You know, that will deliver a lot of problems. And I'll show you that even the big brands make massive mistakes because they think in silos. Um, the examples I'm going to show you right now are Dutch, so I'm going to translate them for you. Um, this is a major airline company, and you all know it. This is Qatar, Qatar Airways. You know? And it says here, book a dream flight to your destination of your dreams. You know, when you really look careful at the, uh, the advertisement, you know, and it says flights you know, from 16 of June 2015, and some really scribbly words down the bottom. You know, in terms of um, copy, this is a very bad advertisement. Why? Um, well, that's quite easy, um, because you need to read the scribbly lines that as of the 16th of June, you can fly from Amsterdam to your you know, destination of your dreams. You know, because it's just basically a bad advertisement. Okay, so if you look at the design, you know, and this is where our direction, you know, this is the first remark I'm going to make. If you think in silos, you get problems in terms of our direction. This is a 1960s, 50s way of art, you know, publicizing your, the Qatar. Uh, but if you make the crossover to QatarAirways.nl, you get automatically redirected to QatarAirways.com, and you end up right here. So this is truly, uh, how would you say it, uh, a modern way of promoting the Qatar brand. So let's go back. This is about 1950s, 1960s, and you come and you land on this page. There's no way you can find or, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the campaign itself. So the crossover from a print campaign onto a very new website is not done properly. And this is where Drupal agencies, who specifically focus on Drupal, have a problem because they ask you, let's build a website and here are the visuals. As an agency, this is one lesson I want to give you, is that as an agency, you should demand, okay, how does the outdoor campaign look like? You know, where is my traffic coming from? You know, is, the, is, is basically the art direction through all channels, you know, done properly? Who, who's in charge? You know, and, and that's why, you know, in, in the past, it was about, about five or six years ago, you know, where we were working with an external design agency. We had to build this website. Um, and, and they send us this InDesign file of one by one meters big. And we said, okay, you know, how big do you want your website to be? You know, it's like, okay, we can't work with this. You know, it was a true design agency, really traditional, focusing on print, had no idea how the internet looked like. So, and then we had to discuss with our clients, as yeah, yeah, you have to use the design, so well, can't use it. You know, that kind of stuff you don't want, definitely not. Because those are the, the discussions, you know, you know, which are not fun to have, you know. You want to work on results, that's what you're aiming for. So, um, so here, you know, you, you, you land on this page from Qatar, and it's just a brand new, different design, you know. You lose your customers here. And I'm going to challenge you, if you, and, and all the major airlines do this, you know, Emirates, you know, they have fantastic, brilliant campaigns of come fly with us to the islands in the Pacific, you know, and I'm, I like traveling, so I'm sitting there in my car waiting for the, the, the traffic lights and just grab my mobile phone, it's like, oh, cool, you know, which islands, you know, so they redirect me to this mobile website and then suddenly you have to, you know, okay, which country are you from, so scrolling down, 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 okay, yep, here we are, Netherlands. And then suddenly, you know, they come like, okay, you want to check your, your, your flight times? No, I want to know to which islands you're flying because your poster is telling me that you're flying to some really cool islands in the Pacific. Never could have find the destinations they were promoting. They lost me as a customer there. Okay, so the big ones, you know, they make mistakes. Here's an example um, of Coca-Cola. I was in London the other day. Um, and, you know, taking the tubes and uh, walking around there and standing in front of this beautiful campaign. Yes, in terms of art, in terms of copy, it's just brilliant. But I was talking about crossovers, you know, I'm standing there, 
you know, in this tube, you know, waiting with my mobile phone in my hand, and they could have got me, you know, and, and is there in this poster any remark that like, okay, uh, share your kiss with Coke, eh? um, uh, via Facebook or, or anything. No, visit Coca-Cola.com uh, for more. I don't know. There's nothing in here, just purely branding. You know, and when we go back to 1980, when Tim Berners-Lee found the internet, he created a revolution. Why? Because advertising suddenly became measurable, you know, and interactive. So if Coca-Cola would have asked me, you know, to to, to serve over to, to 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 go on my mobile and and serve to the, to a specific website, you know, a landing page w with this campaign behind it. They could have placed a cookie on my phone, they could have interacted with me, I could leave my email address, and they can start to interact with me. They didn't, so they lost me here. Bummer. You know, big Coca-Cola firm, you know, is not doing it properly. And when you, you know, whenever you're in London, you know, and then the whole tube is this one big advertisement space, 90% is not making a crossover or ask you to interact with their brand. You know, and that's what the internet is all about. It's about interaction. It's about, you know, uh, engagement, you know. But they don't do it. So you as an agency, you can start, you know, asking questions. You know, if you get a design delivered by some, some advertisement firm or you have to build a website or, or anything, you say, okay, you know, what do you guys do? And, start, and then suddenly you become in charge. You can become in charge in the, uh, of the campaign and you say, like, okay, you know, how are we going to make the crossover? You know, if I have to make a mobile responsive website, you know, and you have an outdoor campaign, how does it work? You know, and there's a, there's a lot of techniques. Um, we were actually the first agency in the world to use QR codes, you know, and all bloggers around the world, you know, they're laughing about QR codes now because they say they are ineffective. Well, that's bollocks. Um, we use QR codes um, and, and we publish them for uh, the, the larger publisher in the Netherlands, Sanoma. Um, and they are truly, truly effective. The problem is, is that bloggers don't want to write about it anymore because they invented it, you know, they, they were writing about it in 2008, you know, and now seven years later, they said, no, I'm not going to write about QR codes anymore because that's old news. You know, but they're still effective. And the, one of the few ways to make a proper crossover towards a mobile website, you know. But there's NFC as well. Unfortunately, Apple is still blocking it. It is within the iPhone 6, you know, but there's no AP uh, available, you know. But um, on uh, the, the Android phones, you can easily cross over now to a mobile uh, website. And then again, you can interact. So as an agency, you can ask us, okay, how are we going to facilitate the crossover? You know, and maybe you can deliver, you know, all the, the, the NFC stickers, which are just a few cents, you know. You know, you, you give about five stickers for, for 10 euros, and that's next to nothing, you know. But, you know, you make it, you know, uh, easier, and you facilitate the consumer in his customer journey through all channels, you know. Um, so if you look at all channels, there's, there's several ways uh, to, to make, to, to facilitate crossovers, um, and you can do it in terms of art, as I sh have shown uh, within the uh, Qatar uh, campaign. Uh, but you can also do it in copy, copy-wise. And I have to translate this for you. This is a campaign which is running right now for the largest real estate agent in the Netherlands. Um, it says, um, this is an online real estate agent. And basically, it's making a, an, a statement against the traditional uh, uh, real estate agents uh, because they say, you can give your, the tour yourself, you know, Basically, you send us some pictures of your house, or um, uh, we publish them online, and you do the tour yourself. So their statement was, um, uh, giving the tour yourself, well, don't let them fool you. Don't be a fool, actually. That's what they say. So you can save a lot of money, and I mean a serious lot of money, you know, by s selling your house online via an online real estate agent and not via a, a, a traditional real estate agent who's doing the tour for you. So we decided to make copy the leading example, you know, of, of through all channels. So this is a sign you put on your house 
Um, yeah, don't let them fool you. Sell your house. Mark Larsland. And this is the first screen of the TV commercial we've made. You know, and it's the same sign again. You know, and when you zoom out, you know, you see a whole street full of the same signs. And then when you make the crossover, because you're interested, you want to sell your house, you go online, you see the same sign, the same screenshot as you've seen in the TV commercial. So basically what we've done is use the same visuals through all channels. Not like Qatar, you know, making, you know, mistakes within crossovers. No, through all channels, you can do it copy-wise, you can do it design-wise. Um, this is how we did it. Okay, so how... How, how does this process work? Oh, yeah, sorry. You've got a question there. Yeah. Sorry, little little question. Yeah. I didn't see the, the URL on the live sign. Is that a, is that a choice? It just yeah. said Maklarsland, not maklarsland.nl or something? Yeah, yeah. It's Maklarsland, but it's the uh, the number one real estate agent in the Netherlands. And Everybody they, knows it. Yeah. And basically, uh, most people use it Google. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, the problem is, you know, we were thinking about, uh, uh, we've been thinking about QR codes, we've been thinking about NFC. The problem is, is they're always about four, four or five meters high, the signs, so you can't scan them, you know. So we've been thinking about it. Um, and if we've, we choose to, to use the, um, the logo yeah, uh, on the bottom and not .nl behind it, you know, we could have done that, but that's not uh, according to the logo house uh, uh, rules, if you know what I mean. All right. Um, so our approach. Um, the funny thing is, is uh, uh, probably you use it all the time. You, we work according to Scrum. You know, Scrum is a way of working. You know, in terms of web development. We also use it by creating advertising campaign, and that is completely new, because normally you get a, a brief, you know, and then you have to create a, a concept and, and some copy, and then you have to pitch it, and they say, yeah, it's great, let's do it. You know, but we've decided to use Scrum within advertising and creating advertising campaigns as well. So throughout all channels, we use Scrum. So I advise you to do so as well, because it's way more efficient. And the funny thing is, is that your client is being involved and, in the end, a lot more happier than you presenting something and now it's become a combined idea of you and your client. So use Scrum. Okay, so, so when you look at the process, um, it all starts with strategy. You know, when a client comes up to us, they, they, they ask us, uh, uh, okay, you want to create a campaign for us? The first thing I'm going to ask them, what's your business goals? And it's like, uh, why? Uh, well, I want to know so I can tell my developers what your goals are so we can meet them. So every layer within my company, you know, every employee knows what your goals are so they can think for you, you know, on, on reaching those goals. We want to meet your targets because if we, if we reach your targets, you know, then you are happy. You know, and, and a while ago uh, we were uh, uh, pitching. I don't like pitches, but, yeah, it's a part of the game because I want to collaborate uh, uh, on the basis of Scrum. But in the pitch process, I called the client and said, okay, what's your budget? We had to build this huge website. And I asked them, what's your return on investment? You know, what's your business plan with this website? And they're like, uh, we don't know. So we started thinking for them, you know, what their business plan was, presented a design during the pitch, but also a business plan on how to uh, uh, create return on investment, you know, within the next three years. That made them happy. We won the pitch. Um, so it all starts with strategy, then comes concept, and then you start thinking about channels, you know, about, okay, uh, is it advertising, is it web, is it mobile? Uh, and we use an agile way, you know, in Scrum, we start creating, um, developing, and we launch it. And then it's always measure the results. Why? So you can... Uh, uh, improve what you've done. We always make assumptions, you know, along the way, and you've got to measure all your assumptions. And I mean, every um, uh, journey you've been creating, measure it. And there's tools for that. Going back to the the the, uh, the, the strategy bit, um, have you guys heard of the UX canvas? You know, it's basically in a short session you make clear, you know, what the client's problems are, you know. Um, it's a really fun session. You sit down with them with sticky notes and stuff, 
Um, okay, give, give us your, your top three problems. Um, now come, let, let's come up with some solutions for that. For, for those three major problems, what, what, what could be a solution? Um, what are your KPIs? You know, what's your, your USP? You know, what's your USP against your competitor? That's really important information if you want to create a campaign or a website or, or, or any form of communication. What's your competitive advantage? You know, what makes you unique? Um, what are your client segments? You know, who do you want to talk to? And this is the basis of every customer journey. Uh, what channels are you using currently? You know, and what channels aren't you using? Um, and these are the questions you know they don't like to talk about. But you know, if you work and cooperate together, you have to be open. You know, so you can create results. Um, what's your global cost structure and what's your income model? You know, and they, they, they're not used to these questions. You know, it says, uh, guys, we just asked for a website. I said, yeah, but we want to deliver results eh, by creating a website. You know, the website is just a tool to create results. And we want to know which results you want. So from here, we go over to the user-centered design. And this is, the, we're not doing everything all the time. This all depends on budget. Um, but have a look at competitive anal uh, analytics, um, uh, determining the target audience, uh, specific target audiences. Uh, and then for every target audience, you can create a user scenario. And those user scenarios, you will basically um, uh, create on your website and through all channels. You know, so if I have, I'll, I'll show you a user scenario later on. Um, content uh, analysis, process mapping, site mapping, wireframes, design, prototyping, user test, and, and a review. So it's all about you know, three phases. It's about the discovery phase, the concepting phase, and the testing phase. Testing is a really, really important bit. So let's have a look at a customer journey. Um, this guy wakes up, or girl, I don't know, 7 a.m., he wakes up, get ready. And the funny thing is, is that when we worked for Sanoma, uh, in the Netherlands, which is a really large publisher. They have this news website. It's called nu.nl or now.nl. Um, and what they've noticed, you know, they, 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 their editors always started at about 7, so the first news would be online at 7.30, uh, because at 7.30 people would be either commuting or in the train. But suddenly they saw this huge peak, you know, in traffic at 7 o'clock. And they couldn't determine, okay, where is this peak coming from? You know, and then they found out, they did some research, is that, and I definitely could guess about 80% is doing it as well, 80% of you guys are using your mobile telephone as an alarm clock. So you go to bed, you put your alarm clock on, put it next to the bed, in the charger, and early in the morning you wake up. So the first thing most of the people do is grabbing the mobile telephone and read the news. But at 7 o'clock, there was still old news on it. So now the editors have to really work early and start early. So at 7 o'clock, the first news headlines should be online. So that's basically the start of a day. So this is your first touch point. You know, people using their alarm clock and go online. You know, and you can easily find out, you know, which websites are being used early in the morning. Um, at 2 past 8, he drinks some coffee, reads some news, newspaper, traditional newspaper, and checks his email. Um, then he drives to work, uh, he uses his mobile telephone for navigation, and he passes a lot of uh, outdoor advertising spots. Um, at 9 a.m., his workday starts um, using a uh, tablet and um, uh, laptop, a computer, and at 12 p.m., he eats this, well, you read, I think it's a cheeseburger, and reads some magazines on the, um, uh, at his office. Um, at exactly 2.48, uh, he takes a break, eats an apple, uh, uses his mobile telephone to check his socials, and then at 5 p.m., um, he probably works for the government, um, strictly he drives home, uses his navigation again, passes some outdoor signs, and at home, uses his tablet, watches some television, and just before bed, he reads a book or a magazine or anything. And this is a journey, and, and you can identify a lot of touch points here. You know, and those touch points you can use in your communication. Um, in the Netherlands, we created a Roadworks campaign. Um, this campaign, we won a lot of prizes with it because we introduced social 
uh, to interact with people who were driving on the highway um, from uh, uh, Utrecht all the way to The Hague in the Netherlands. And that is, is one of the major, major uh, arteries in our uh, um, road network. And they were about to close that highway, you know, going from three to two to one lane, and then a one weekend, just you know, fully close it, and then back to four lanes. Um, what we did, we created this campaign uh, targeting several types of audiences. Um, and we have this model for this, um, and this, we call it the gift model. Um, so we created several personas. And sorry, this is still in Dutch because we've used it. I'll translate it for you. Uh, so right here, you have your personas. Um, and these are the daily commuters. We had, it was the summertime, so we had a lot of tourists on the highway as well. We have uh, uh, truck drivers. We had the press. And we had employees. Never forget employee as a target audience. Really important because they're ambassadors. You know, they, they go to, in the weekend, they, they sit at parties and telling about their work and the stuff they've been doing. You know, and they always get questions, okay, so, so, so what's been up to? So never forget your, your um, uh, um, employees as well. Um, so we define goals for every type of personas. Then we created, uh, we found out what their informational needs were, then their functional needs, and what triggers them. You know, really important is to know what triggers them. Um, if you know the triggers, you can act on it. So this is what we call the gift model. Really handy tool, really nice, you know, four-hour session with your client, and you can really map all uh, the, the goals, the informational needs, and the functional needs. Um, customer journey mapping, really important too. So, so um, if you have, um, uh, we, we use the, uh, the AIDA model. I don't know if you know the AIDA model. is attention, interest, desire, and action. Okay, so how, how do we get attention? How do we um, uh, uh, get interest? You know, what, what are the desires and what are their actions? You know, so this is um, uh, also a nice session to have with your clients uh, and walk through all your personas and, and uh, um, follow the AIDA model. Um, if you look at a customer journey, and I'm, I'm talking about customer journeys here and, and the way we interact and, and we use websites for that. We use mobile telephones and stuff. But there's a whole lot more you can challenge your client with. Take, for example, this. This is, um, this is KPN, a large telecom provider in the Netherlands, and they send bills to you, you know, like, like every month or so. A bill is a really, you know, easy form of communication because every month you get one. You know, it's not funny to see how much you've been calling, you know, but it's a way of, of, of communication as well. And do people really understand their, 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 uh, their invoice? You know, sometimes it's just a mess. You know, you look at it, I have no idea what I'm looking at right here. So, so um, service design is really, really important throughout all channels, you know. Um, for example, you know, uh, uh, I, uh, I'm a Vodafone member. Yes, I've worked there, so I'm still a Vodafone member. Um, and I was over in my budget, you know, and they sent me an SMS. Say, okay, hey, Mike, listen up. You know, you're, you're past your budget now. Uh, we have to charge you a little bit more. We're sorry for that. But be aware that if you, you know, st start traveling uh, abroad, it'll cost you. Well, thanks for that, Vodafone. I'm really happy, you know. Service design makes you happy along the way, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, cashiers, you know, how does it work in store? You know, we, uh, you, uh, Nike, for example, you know, you have this really beautiful outdoor campaign. You go to your mobile telephone. You learn about your shoes. Like, yeah, wow, cool. You know, but, you know, okay, I, I, maybe I don't want to buy it online. I go into the store, and this really grumpy sales guy stands in front of you. Oh, you want my shoe? You want the shoe? And you're like, no, you don't feel happy, you know. So, you know. All those questions, if you ask your client, okay, how does the customer journey look, you know, and, and is, is, is your service designed through all channels in an optimal way, you know, performed or done? You know, how's your call center look like? You know, um, I had some interactions in the past with call centers, you know, you don't want to believe what happened, you know. Uh, they didn't make me happy, they made me angry, you know. So, so it's really important that you look at service design as well. So, but service design is not about thinking it's about doing. 
So challenge your, uh, your clients, you know, challenge your, the, the brands you're working with to think about this. Because it all affects the results of what you've been doing. You know, if you've been building that website and the service design sucks, um, uh, or um, their, their campaigns are not in line you know, with your website, you will never reach results. And the problem is, when you don't reach your results, they start looking for another agency. You know, because they blame you. They will never blame themselves. Never. They won't do that. So that's the problem. You know, so um, service design thinking is doing. Okay, and now back to Drupal. You know, I'm talking about advertisement. I'm talking about marketing. Now, what is Drupal actually doing, you know, to become a player within this field of marketing? You know, what kind of modules are we producing to help understand the client's need, you know, to interact with those clients, you know? Are we targeting them, retargeting, personalization, you know, web optimization? Are we, are we all building that? Well, not really, you know. There's one part who's doing it, you know, and they're doing it well. And it's Acquia. It's not open source. No. And Acquia has moved its way into the Gartner Magic Quadrant. Why? Because they understand the needs of the, the consumer nowadays, the, what we call always connected consumer. The always connected consumer is out there, he has a voice, they want interaction, and brands want to interact. They also want to measure, they want to measure results, and they want to personalize, because as a consumer, you know, I, I'm, I'm not interested in advertisement or, or content about baby nappies and stuff. No, I'm not interested about that. No, I'm past that stage, you know. And that content personalization, there's, there's a couple of companies who are truly, truly focusing on it. Uh, and that's Adobe and that's Sitecore. And they're up there. You know, and Acquia is competing with them. And I can understand why, because I've been telling you guys, is that the customer journey goes through all channels and we want personalized content. You know, we want it targeted. You know, and Acquia is doing it. But what does Drupal actually doing it? Why is Drupal not right here? And is Acquia there? So what, this is basically, I want to start an open source revolution, talking about, you know, in 1980, the internet revolution started, Coke started the consumer revolution, and maybe we should start an open source marketing revolution. Maybe we should work and combine and, and work together, you know, to make Drupal into an optimal marketing tool. Because it is all about communication. A, a website is about communication. Um, um, even an intranet, you know, or an e-commerce platform, it's all about communication, it's all about marketing, it's all about making crossovers. You know, because, for example, you know, intranet, you know, you publish this new uh, a column on it or, or some new articles, you know, you have to make people aware by email marketing that there's new articles on your, um, on your website. You know, so, so um, and how many times those articles are being re uh, uh, read, you know? Is it personalized? So I think we should change Drupal, you know, and go fast forward and make sure that we can beat these guys up here, Adobe and Sitecore, either together with Acquia, but also Drupal itself. And that's, what I'm, that's basically what I'm here for, is basically, guys, I'm reaching out to you to start thinking in a new kind of way a marketing communication kind of way, thinking about all channels so you, well, with your, your, so you can reach results, but also think about the fact that Drupal is lacking now the tools that those marketeers need to create those results. You know, and there's a lot of work to be done, yes, and yes, Acquia Lift is doing it. Yeah. You know, have you, have you guys been visiting, you know, your competitors, you know, events of Sitecore and Adobe? I was there. I was at the Adobe event in London, you know, and I was shocked. Yes, I was shocked. It was so interesting to see. Um, for example, Adidas, you know, they work with uh, Adobe. What they've done, um, they created 
um, they, they had a new shoe, you know, so they had their outdoor campaigns and stuff with, you know, crossovers and, uh, and then you have this website. And um, the web is m being dominated actually by Google, by basically Google results. Everybody's searching Google now to find the product. Um, so the, the actual website is not dominating, you know, anymore. It's about landing pages. So what did Adobe do? They created landing page optimizer. So it's a tool, you know, you start creating a landing page, then you go to the Adobe Creative Suite, you know, where all your visuals are in there, which are automatically linked to uh, their analytics program, and you could say, uh, see which visuals have been the most successful in terms of click-throughs. So, okay, okay, so you've got three visuals of this shoe, and I could click on you know, all three of them, but the analytics says, no, you have to choose this one because your click-throughs will be enhanced using this visual of this shoe. Okay, so you click on that one. And then what you do, this tool is really awesome, by the way, uh, you type in your competitors, and it starts browsing the internet for landing pages of your competitors, looking which kind of keywords they were using you know, to promote their shoe and their prices. And then you can create this optimum you know, landing page within minutes and start competing with your customers. Can we do this with Drupal? Not yet. You know, but this is what the big boys want. You know, and if the big boys want it, you know, it always goes down. You know, and then all major companies want it. So landing page optimization, um, uh, that, that those tools we should work on. And that's what I'm addressing. Um, I hope this presentation has given you, you know, enough insights in the way we think as an agency, the way we work as an agency, and I hope you're going to adopt it as well. You know, start challenging your clients, you know, with all the questions and all the stuff I've been telling you, and, and you'll see, you'll get the results which they need, and they'll love it, and they'll love you for it, you know, and they'll put, probably, you know, put a lot of more work, you know, into your uh, company as well. So. That's it for now. Um, let's work on it um, and maybe start a discussion online about how we're going to create those tools uh, and uh, see if we can get Drupal in the uh, Magic Quadrant as well. How cool will that be? You know, the first open source project in the Adobe Quadrant. That's awesome. All right, thank you very much. If you have any questions, let me know. Any questions? No. I'll be around here uh, all day. So uh, yeah, if you you know uh, come up with a question later on, just let me know. All right. Thank you very much.